Broncos fans have because today the pads come on for the first time at Broncos training camp. Players like Javante Williams, Pat Sertan, Draymond Jones, they're all looking to hit. Bobby Massey, you see him, he's doing extra push-ups, getting ready. Jerry Judy there as well. Again, the first padded practice is also a good time to check in on our first-year players. The 2021 draft class will be in the spotlight as we take a little bit of a deeper look at some of these newer Broncos. And we've got one of the best to ever do it again here on our stage. Welcome in to Broncos Training Camp Live, presented by U.S. Bank. I'm Matt Boyer. Day six, Broncos country. It's the first time that the Broncos are allowed to have a padded practice per the new collective bargaining agreement. So this is going to look a lot more like NFL football on Sundays than anything we've seen before in training camp this year. We're going to have one-on-one -on -one periods more team periods, so a lot to look forward to today as we get into training camp. A couple of news and note items to get to today. Yesterday during practice, we saw for the first time Bradley Chubb and Vaughn Miller lined up across from one another along that defensive line. It was Chubb's first time participating in practice. He had been doing work off to the side up until yesterday, so good to see 58 and 55 along that defensive line. Vic Fangio said Chubb's just going to continue to ramp things up. Fangio also told reporters on Monday Josie Jewell will be out for about 10 days with a groin injury. Fangio said it isn't serious, but they're going to be cautious, which means more reps for Justin Stranod. And another injury of note, Tyree Cleveland was held out of practice yesterday due to a back injury sustained on a hard fall from Saturday's practice. So a lot to look forward to if you are a Broncos fan here today. Now, Broncos country. Each day, our guy, Steve Atwater, is bringing the heat with his guest list, and today is no exception. We told you we're talking about the rookies, and this guy earned his spot in 1995 in the preseason. Ooh. You see, look at look that, at that look, at, look, look at that, that 2,000 yards look at right, that, there. Man, right there. Celebration, <laughs> An MVP, a Super Bowl MVP, a two-time Super Bowl champ. Terrell Davis is in the house. TD, welcome to Broncos training camp. It's good to see you. It is good to be here, yes. <laughs> in the words of Eddie Murphy. <laughs> but what's funny is you're talking about this is the first time that they're putting pads on, and it's like they're allowed to put pads on. Steve, I just I, it's incredible how they only have, have a certain amount of times they can put pads on. When we played, it's unlimited pads were every day, two times a day, and do we even have a break-in period like that? Did we have a few days where we didn't go pads? That was off season. That was off season stuff. It was. It was. <laughs> but I, you know, I, but I appreciated pads. I liked pads, and and for a number of reasons. But I think number one was I knew exactly what the speed was with pads on. When you don't have pads on, you have to kind of gauge things. Are you going fast? Are you not going right. fast? Like you know, so you, everybody's trying to figure out each other's you know speed right with pads i know steve is coming Ooh, no i, I know coming. i'm coming <laughs> so we're gonna figure this thing out and see what go that what goes down so i love pads and then i felt protected with pads you know but i just enjoyed it i, I like those kind of practices i thought padded practices were the, were the ones that really shaped and molded our team to just to gel better you know i i get it people don't like to bang anymore and some coaches have taken that to another level where they just hit too much you know? but, but I don't know, man. It seems like to me, and it may just be me, the stats may not back this up, but it seems like there are more injuries now yeah. that they're not yeah. in pads than there were back when we were in pads. Yeah, yeah, I think so, too. And part of that, and it's my theory, it, it hasn't been proven or not, but most of these guys train all over the, the country. Versus? we, I stayed here. Yeah, me too. And so my training was in line with what the, tra the team training was doing. So, you know, it, it wasn't different. They knew exactly that we had pads on. They knew all that stuff. So... It was easier for me to, to adjust to, the, to our team's workout and practice versus going to California training or Florida or Texas and then trying to come back here and adjust. And I think that's where you're seeing those injuries. Yeah. So, TD. Just a theory, though. No, no, no. Hey, I like it. I like <laughs> it. It's a good theory. Hey, so Javante Williams, yeah. second round running back. Um, man, he's a great player. Too. How's he looking? He's looking looking, looking good. <laughs> well, you know, a whole bunch of players look good until so you put the pads on. <laughs> But I've seen him in pads in college, yeah. and I think he's going to be the same as he was in college. What's it like for a rookie coming in, you know, trying to get the flow of the game, trying to learn the playbook, you know, coming out here in first training camp? What was that like for you when, when, when you were a rookie? Well, I, I was not drafted high, Steve, so I didn't have the expectations. Did you get as many reps? I didn't get a ref, so I didn't have expectations. But what I tried to do was not disqualify myself from playing. And what I mean by that was 
know the plays. I tried to give effort. I tried to not have the coaches pull me out and say he's not ready to play. Right. That was it. And that was that was all I, I focused on. Because what you don't probably don't know, but I was looking forward to trying to make the practice squad. That was that was my goal. Was if I could make the practice squad, I am <laughs> that was my that was my goal. And so I would go to practice and just, you know, Bobby Turner was on me, but I just wanted to make sure that I, I was not having him pull me out and, and sit me down because I knew my, my opportunities were going to be limited. Yeah. Um, but when you come in and Javante Williams, he's he, he, he doesn't have the same problems that I had. He's going to be given a lot of opportunities to play well. But I think the mindset has to be the same. That's what I was going to say. Do, do some players, is, could that be a detriment for some players to know that, hey, man, I'm on this team. I'm some, good. Yeah, I, I it's, it's individual, right? right? Absolutely. Um, some individuals come in here and they, once you say, all right, you, you anoint them the starter, they don't push hard. Right. Some guys come in here and they're like, you know what, I know that you're giving me this opportunity and you, you expect me to be the starter, but I have to prove it. And that's the, that's the mindset you want. I need to go prove it. But it's, uh, it's it, now more than any time, I think these kids are already prepared. Like, they're much more prepared than we were coming in. That's my opinion because it's For, football prepare year. Prepare how? Mentally, physically? I just, I just think with football, football is year-round now. It's so much more year-round. You have so many so many specialists and camps, and you have all this, you know, technology. You have you have resources that you can look at I stuff. I don't know, man. But because I, 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 say, I say I don't know because I look at a guy like Lloyd Cushenberry. Yeah. Last year's, uh, what was it, third-round draft pick? Yep. Last year. He came in. He played every game. He started every game, did okay, but he just he wasn't strong enough. Right. I think mentally he did okay, but he just he, he wasn't strong enough. I think he's gotten there over. He's gotten closer. I'll, I'll see with the pads on today, but I think Lloyd Cushenberry is going to be a beast when he finally becomes the man that you know he's going to grow into. Uh, and yeah, that, that well, could I'm start. Not, to I'm not saying you're not going. You, I'm not saying they're full grown men. Yeah. I, I'm just saying like coming in, they're definitely more prepared than we were. I just, yeah, I, I just feel that way. It's it's no longer, I just feel like they have so much that they can work with. You know, they have all these different specialists, and they have all these different people, especially from the physical standpoint, all these biomechanics, yeah. and they're, 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 Steve, we were eating McDonald's for lunch, man. <laughs> Come on, don't tell people that, TD, man. We were eating, <laughs> dude, our breakfast was anybody in your in your, in your position group, go get some food, right. go go get the donuts. Quizno. Bring the donuts to breakfast. We didn't, we didn't have the, the, the all these nutritionists. We didn't have all that stuff. Yeah. So that's what I mean by they, I they have so much more advantage than we had. You go into the, the, into the, the mill room now, they've got the – the smoothie station. You got the protein station. You got this station. Right. You got your carb station. Man, <laughs> <laughs> man that good. You got ten different people on your on your own payroll that they that, that they go with you to your games. To do what? Rod, Rod Smith told us, TD, that back when he was going to training camp in Greeley, late night Wendy's was his deal. He would go out, get himself, get himself a little snack, and come back before curfew. That was that was pretty typical, wasn't it? Right. That, that was the meal. That was our, <laughs> yep. that was our meal plan. And I, I would never forget. I, I remember like my rookie year, and I'm just doing like everybody else. I'm getting fast food. We're getting getting Wendy's from down the street. And Shannon Sharp walks by, and he's like, "Hey, man, you can't keep. You're not going to be able to do that." Right. You know, too much longer. And I'm like, man, listen, I'm, I'm young. My, I mean, my metabolism's high. I'm like, please, dude, like, this is what I'm going to be doing. And about three years later, I could not eat that same stuff. Yeah. You know, I would eat that before practice, go out there, and it would just sit in my stomach. And so I had to start to eat better. And Shannon was the first one that, that really taught he's me. He's always been like that. That's crazy. He was the one that I looked at and was like, okay, he's doing it the right way. Right. You know, his meals are, are being prepared um, you know, when he goes home, he's, he goes, he puts them in these little, you know, Tupperware containers. So I started doing that, and it really made a huge difference, man. Because we we assume that we burn so many calories that we can just eat what we want to eat, but that's not true. You know, so yeah, you, you got to have the best carbs in your body, man. So now the team huddling up, everybody getting in. What are they saying, Steve? What, what, what they're talking about? Hey, got to go out and have a good practice. <laughs> <laughs> Offensive guys saying, y'all take it easy on us. <laughs> we, we promised our folks at home a breakdown of the Broncos draft class so let's get to a couple of those guys 10 picks in all and 
Steve and TD, this list is about as impressive as we've seen in recent memory. Of course, it starts with number two, Pat Sertan, who is having an excellent camp so far. Javante Williams, the running back, number 33, second round pick. Quinn Miners, the third rounder, slowly working his way into the rotation on Vic Fangio's offensive line. Caden Stearns, Jamar Johnson, back-to-back -back safety picks for the Broncos. Seth Williams out there at wide receiver. Now, TD and Steve, you guys were, there's page two right there, Browning at linebacker. We haven't seen him yet. He's still on the pup list. Kerry Vincent Jr. This will only be Kerry Vincent Jr.'s second practice due to being on the COVID-19 reserve list coming off for the first time this weekend. Jonathan Cooper at outside linebacker also looking to make a name for himself. And we round things out with Marquis Spencer. So guys, we've got a sixth round pick and we've got a first round pick. TD, I want to start with you. You mentioned just trying to make the practice squad. I mean, those late round guys that we just mentioned, the guys like Marquis Spencer and Jonathan Cooper, Bar those guys, what's their mentality going in here? What should it be going in if you're a low round pick trying to make a name? I've always said you have got to find a way to make people, coaches, and your teammates notice you. Whatever that is, you've got to make sure that when they walk out there, they say, okay, that guy, Whatever his name is, they'll call you by, like, they, no one even knew my, my name when I first started playing. Was yes, number, they did. No, they didn't. It was number 30. <laughs> 30. 30. <laughs> hey, 30. 30. I thought that was my name after a while. It was number 30. Um, but that's it. it. It's really, and going back to what I said before, keep it simple, man. Just make sure that what they're teaching you, you retain that, and you do not disqualify yourself. Because you, you're not going to have as many chances as somebody coming in as a first rounder, a second rounder, maybe even a third rounder. It's limited. And you have to show you're coachable. You got to show that you, you, you can make improvements quickly. And because they're not going to waste a lot of time with you. The minute they put you in and you make that mistake, they might give you another shot. You make another one, it's, you, you're not going to see a third chance to do it. So my mentality was always do not disqualify myself and make sure that I'm, I'm prepared mentally. Even if I'm not getting the physical reps, make sure you're watching everything. So when it's your turn, you go in there and you execute. That little kid, that's a nice jersey right there, by the way. That's, 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 that's an awesome jersey right there. See a couple of 30 jerseys yeah. out there on that hill. Steve, <laughs> with a guy like Pat Sertan, we're watching him go through warm-ups right now. A guy like Sertan, first-round pick, TD just mentioned making a name for yourself. When you've got that much hype and that much publicity coming in yourself, first-round pick, is special teams a thing that you need to be still need to be concerned about, or is it just you know, hey, I I'm gonna be all defense all the time. No, so you gotta you gotta be just like the free agent. You gotta have that mentality that hey, I don't have a uh, I don't have a place on this team yet. Uh, especially if you want to come in and have an impact your rookie year, which my rookie year I didn't know if I was gonna have an impact or not. I just I just say yeah, I'm in the NFL. I wanna I wanna make this team, and I'm gonna do everything I can full speed. I'm gonna go home and study. I don't have to take any classes. I don't have to go to a history <laughs> class. I don't have to go to these. Uh, uh, math Steve, classes. you weren't going to history class anyway. What are you talking about? <laughs> you were skipping history class and math class and every other class. What are you talking about? I don't have to go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So I didn't have to go to class. I, I figured all I had to do was play football. Like, bro, I, I can do that. I can, I can study this playbook all night. <laughs> We've talked to a couple of guys, though, Steve. I mean, Alfred Williams we talked to a little bit about this, Carl Mecklenburg. These guys said it took them a couple of years before they got into a rhythm when they came into training camp. TD, at what point did the, the switch kind of flip for you as to, like, oh, I've really got to handle a training camp now. Was it year two, three, or right when you came in as a rookie? No, it, was, it, it took a while. It took a while. To, and back to, like, Steve's point, you you know, you, in college you have a break. You know exactly. You have so many hours of sports, and then you have other obligations. But here, it's that's what it is. It's your job. And you've got to find a way to be a professional. And I just – what I tried to do was look at other players. I tried to look at the veterans, you know, to see who was doing the things right uh, on the field and then try to see what they were doing right off the field. And I mentioned earlier the guy that I just – I just kept, my eyes kept going back to was Shannon. I kept yep. watching this guy on the field, and then I'm like, wait, man, the dude looked like, I mean, just a Greek god. He just chiseled, and then <laughs> right. he's balling, and he's just, he was a player. And then you, you see him off the field, and then you start watching. He never hung out. I'd never seen Shannon go out. You never. know, he didn't hang out with the guys. So I used to ask him, man, what do you do? Like, what do you do when everybody's out at the, at the bar? Man, I don't do that stuff, man. I don't go out. It's like, really? Yeah. So... 
he had his way of doing things, and it worked for him. And I had to find what worked for me, and it wasn't his way because I couldn't have, <laughs> I couldn't do what he was doing. So I kind of I, I took his ways. I kind of took things from John. I took things from Steve. I remember going to Steve's house, and you know he had you know the family stuff, and you know I, he was the guy I went to when I was, when I bought my first house. I wanted right. I want to live in his neighborhood. <laughs> I was like, shoot, Steve, what? I see I see Steve over there. We live right around the corner from yeah. each other. Yeah. So I, I so I had a lot of a lot of guys on the team that I kind of. Uh, modeled myself after and just kind of put it together to kind of form my own system if you will and uh it worked for me but you don't ever feel figure it out I, the one thing i that i took away from training camps was when i went to training camp i always tried to go to training camp like i didn't know anything yeah because if you go and you think you know everything it's number one you shut your mind off from learning you have a fixed mentality versus a uh, a mentality of, of growth and I, I didn't want that. I wanted to always look at a play and figure out that play. I know it. I've ran that play a thousand times, but, I, you know, the Z on the backside. All right, never paid attention to that. Well, what is he doing? Why is he doing what he's doing? So it allowed me to have a better knowledge of, of the offense. So when I'm running the football, I know I can feel confident. If I was to break the ball back, I know exactly what Rod's doing on the backside or Ed McCaffrey or Shannon or whoever is back there. And I think that allowed my game to grow to have a better understanding of the entire offense, offense versus just going to camp. Most people go to camp every year, and it, it, it can get monotonous. It can get boring. You're going through the same installs. You're like, all right, <laughs> you start falling asleep in the team meetings. <laughs> right, right. I challenged myself to learn something new so that I always wanted to, to grow and feel like training camps, I was getting better versus staying stagnant and, you know, right there. It, we always say in this league, man, if you're either getting better or you're getting worse, there is no there is no maintaining. So, T.D., training camp has changed quite a bit from back in the day. We used to be dead tired in between practice. We used yeah. to have to go back to, to, the, to the dorm room and take a nap. <laughs> I don't know if you took a nap or not. I did. Excuse me? I'm the king of naps. <laughs> I'm the king of naps. Now, now, do you think that – the way that it is now, which I, I think overall is, is better for the game because guys stay healthier. Well, yeah. take, you know, theoretically, I don't know if that's actually the case, but uh, it, hopefully guys' careers will be longer and all that. But do you think they, they're missing something by not having the pads or not practicing a little bit harder than they are? You know, I, I don't, man. I, you know, <laughs> you know we, we sit here. I know people are tired of hearing about the old guys. I'm like, oh, we used to do it this way. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. When we played, we did it that way. I am, again, I'm, I'm more, my mindset is these these players adapted to a different style of football. Yeah. And it, it's, it, and it hasn't hindered their development. Yeah. Which is great. Last year was really an example that you didn't need to have as much training camp. You didn't need to have as many two of days you didn't need to hit as much you don't even need to have that many preseason games to have a really efficient effective squad i don't know i don't agree with that you don't agree with that are you talking about the broncos are you talking about are you talking league wide well <laughs> you talking I'm, about the i'm talking about teams who were in the just say the lower half or teams where they have new coaching staff new offensive system new defensive systems i think we need to see guys players who are on new teams they need reps to see Hey, are these guys going to compete the same way they, 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 that they did at the last team? Are they picking up this offense or this defense? Are they picking up the plays? Is the coaching gelling? Is it resonating with the play? I, I think you need to see some of that. I don't. Well, well, yeah. I mean, so you you think we need a fourth preseason game? Rod Smith made that point, no, Steve. They don't play anyway. <laughs> Steve, game. Steve Rod Smith made the point that you know if, if there wasn't if there were more preseason games, guys like TD could make the the plays that he did back when you guys played in Japan against the 49ers on the kickoff return there's just there's more opportunities for guys isn't there so you want more preseason games I don't know I'm, he, he, I'm arguing against more preseason games Rod made that argument what oh, I'm yeah, saying yeah. what, what I'm saying is this we just saw a man leave his team that he was with I'm amazing 19 go ahead all right <laughs> Go to another team where he didn't know a I mean, just completely different offense, completely different whatever. No preseason games, no nothing. And they were able to just somehow figure it out during the season and win a Super Bowl. If that's not enough to tell you, now, I mean, that might be 
I know it's kind of the outlier. I get it. It's definitely the outlier. But then, so when you watched the season last year, did you watch games thinking, oh, man, they needed preseason games. They needed more training camp. No. Okay, then. I didn't feel that so, way. No, some did. But, that, was the best. But, that's, but that's every year, Steve. Every year you can look at every team and say, well, that team, they needed more that more preseason games where they should have played more. Like, we don't know. We don't know why they weren't performing well. We just know that they weren't performing well. So my point is, when I look at the players, I, I always look at it as they, they're different. These, these kids will adjust, these young kids, the young men, they will adjust to whatever is put in front of them. If you make them have four preseason games, they will adjust. If you say they got to play, have two a days, they will adjust. Yeah, and well, they've adjusted to having less of that, but the product on the field is still very good. Yeah, well, I, I would say, though, maybe it's not the games, but would you agree they do need time together to practice and get on the same page with the different offenses, different defenses, plays, and all that? Yeah, but they, they're getting that during the season. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're getting that. Yeah, these kids, I mean, these, these young men, they were doing Zoom calls last year. It was, they, they were on, they were, do, and, and when I talked to some of the players, not necessarily on the Broncos, but a lot of players said that they had, that that was better for them, that they were able to get more out of the Zoom calls mm -hmm. than if they were doing those things in person. Um, and so when I'm hearing that from players saying, you know, I, that it was more effective doing it that way. Wow. So now... That birthed a new, a new way of teaching, right? So now, if you're a coach, you, you're limited to your hour on the field or whatever it is. So now you call them up. Let's just do 30 minutes of Zoom. Let's get a 30 minute call in. I don't even know if that's against the CBA. I mean, there's so many rules. What what kind of uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna take a break real quick, TD, and go to Javante Williams. There's your coach Williams. right there. There's your coach. Yeah, yeah there we go, go. Eddie. Eddie D. That's my man. Eddie D's gonna be tasked with stopping <laughs> Javante Williams today at practice. Sidney Jones caught up with the Broncos rookie running back prior to his first padded practice. Javante, first day in pads. How's it feel? I feel pretty good. I'm ready to go. I'm excited. What excites you most about finally getting those pads on? Um, I don't know. I think it's just the Broncos jersey and just actually been in the league and, like, my first actual, like, NFL, like, real-life practice. I think that's the most exciting part. How's the first week gone for you? Finally feeling like you're getting in the groove of things? Mm-hmm. Um, when I came back, the altitude was still a little bit challenging, but, like, I feel like I'm getting in the groove now. Um, everything's starting to slow down. Um, I'm learning a lot of new stuff every day from the vets and just from everybody on the team. So, um, yeah, everything going good. You feel like you finally adjusted to the altitude? Yeah, I think I'm good now. <laughs> What area of your game are you looking to, you know, most improve on and focus on throughout the next couple weeks of camp? Uh -huh, um, with the pads on, definitely blocking. I feel like that's going to get, like, a lot more physical. Um, after blocking, probably just, like, my vision and just taking, like, little small steps each day to get better. How beneficial is it to you to have, you know, Melvin, Mike Boone, Royce, all those vets in the running back room with you? Yeah, um, it's kind of like something, like, to lean back on, um, just knowing, like, yeah, they pretty much know the playbook. So, like, if I ever got any questions or anything, they could just help me out and um, just make sure I'm straight. Well, Javante, we look forward to seeing how physical you can be out there. Thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. All right, guys, back to you. A talented running backs room that the Broncos have, finally able to put on the pads and show what they can do for the first time so far this training camp in a physical manner. TD, as a rookie, we just heard Javante talk about blocking. How important is it for a young guy, young running back, to come in and, and really hone in on that part of the game? It is, um, it's almost, um, it's super important, man. I mean, it's, it, it really is almost, I wouldn't say it's more important than being a, a good runner, but it's up, it's up there. So when I came in as a rookie, coming from Georgia, where I felt that I had a little bit of an advantage over the backs that I was in the room with, whether it was true or not, it didn't matter. I believe it. Right. Was I was willing to block. I was willing. I, I could block. I was a decent, you know, I can catch the football decently. And I can run. So, but I knew blocking was, was what was going to keep me on the field. I could not get number seven hit. And we were just talking about it during the break. Like, did I like blocking? I wouldn't say I loved it, <laughs> but it was, it. it was required. Yeah. And I wasn't, I wasn't upset. I don't know if you remember this, but I got singled out for blocking. That was my first – Mike Shanahan, we, did, we were doing goal line, 
And this wasn't like pass blocking. This was run blocking. They put me, my first year we had Aaron Craver as our fullback. I was the halfback. But our plays was the true West Coast offense, which meant, meant that the backs were interchangeable. So if we call the play, let's say we're running 16 power, which I'm on the left, Aaron's on the right. And he's blocking for me. Well, if they switch to 17 power, we don't switch. I become the blocker on the left side. Aaron gets the ball. So we ran that play a lot. And we're on the goal line, and we're running 17 power. I go in there, and I just, I mean, I played fullback in high school, played fullback growing up. So I, I do, hit the linebacker, drove him out. Trucked him. And that play, Mike, the next morning when we had our team meeting, they played that play. And they were like, this is what we're talking about. Mm. This is the effort. And I'm a rookie. So for him to He's single like, me Whoa. out, play, put this play on the, on the board and let the whole team see it, that's, that's what I meant by you have to catch the attention of the coaches. I think I remember that. By meeting. any means. I think TD was asleep and he said, uh, <laughs> like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah, I probably was asleep. I probably was asleep. That's, that, 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 was, that was my thing now. <laughs> I can promise you guys nobody is sleeping on PS2 so far here in training camp. The Broncos' first round pick. For more on him, let's head down to Alexis Perry. Hey, Alexis. Hey, Matt, you know what? The more I watch Pat Sertan the second, the more I am convinced that we are witnessing a generational talent. Dare I say the next champ Bailey for the Denver Broncos. And honestly, I don't really feel like that's a hot take. We're just five days into his first training camp and PS2 looks absolutely nothing like a rookie and guys the Broncos aren't treating him like one either PS2 has played everywhere on the field from nickel to dime outside everything in between coach Fangio said it's rare to ask a rookie to do that but it's also rare for a first year player to be able to handle and execute all of it and execution is exactly what we saw yesterday as he got his first interception of camp now coach Fangio made sure to add that while Pat hasn't perfected any of the multiple assignments he's been given the staff does doesn't believe it's a task too big for the Alabama product. Sertan isn't just impressing the coaching staff either. He's already gained the respect of the veterans in the room like Bryce Callahan, who said Sertan has picked up the defense in multiple spots on the field, probably the quickest of any rookie he has ever seen. The only thing that's rookie about him, you guys, is that he rides the bus to practice with the rest of the first-year players. Other than that, this 21-year-old is a man. Keep your eye on number two today. I promise you at some point you will be wowed. This guy can do it all. Back up to you guys. Yes, yes. Pass the tan a second. We're looking to see what he uh -oh. is going to do with the pads Steve, on. All right, I need your early, your early prognostics. What's up? What, who, who, is, who does he project to be? Like, like Hall of Famer? Like, what, what, what would you put him? Like a little, little prime, a little bit of Rod. Little champ, bit. okay, yeah, champ. Yeah, champ Bailey. Like I said, champ. I, I like, I like that uh, comparison. And I watched a lot of film of him in college with him at the University of Alabama. I want to see him with pads on here. Uh, it is. It's quite early, especially to compare him to, you know, a Champ Bailey or, uh, you know, Rod Woodson, Dion. Come on, man. You know, I mean, how, you know how we do it. We, yeah, you know we like to yeah, do that. Yeah, it's, it's early, <laughs> man. It's early. Uh, but, you know, from what I've seen, I think he has all the ingredients to, to, to be that type of player. Uh, he has a pedigree. His dad, yeah. uh, multi-year pro bowler, uh, should be a consideration for the Hall of Fame. Uh, but, man, this guy, he's got something special. And uh, his studying, his, his uh, analysis of the game, you know, this guy's playing cover two, like playing half, like, like the safety scan. And he's got, this, he got the size to play safety as well. Uh, so I, uh, I can't say. I can't say right now. Uh, and give me a few more days. I want to see him with pads. I want to see him. You know, see how he comes up and, and thuds up and that type of thing, and I think I'll be able to give you a little bit better uh, idea. Is it me or, or did I just, am I seeing? I, it, it's, it's probably happening. You're seeing a lot more players who their dads have played professional football. That's also where I, when I get back to saying these kids, they're, they're coming ready. in more ready. Yeah. My dad never played football. <laughs> right. I, I didn't have that to lean on. Yeah. But now even in college, there's so many – professional players who have kids in college that they're preparing them more yeah they're I able agree. to give them that the information before they're at, you know the, the answer to the test before they even see it um and so that's what i'm i meant by that these kids are just they are much more advanced than i know 
like we were. Yeah, you got Ed. Ed yeah, right? yeah, Christian, yes. I mean, you just it's just so many different players out there, and I think they just have a little bit of a little bit of an advantage over us. And I say Pastor Tan, you know, their, their situation is great because you know, a lot of times, you know, a lot of professional athletes they've been in relationships, they're out of relationships, and you know, don't end up being in their kids' lives, and their kids do go on and play, but they they haven't had that impact. Whereas Pastor Tan. Uh, the first, <laughs> Pastor Dan, Satan, the second's dad, he was in, he's was in. he been in his life the whole time, coaching him up. And I, I think that plays a big part. And he plays the exact same position that he played. That helps to where uh, he's just on a whole other level. PS2 also said that uh, one of his dad's teammates, Sam Madison, played a big role in his oh, uh, in no, his Sam. in his development. I love Sam. <laughs> yeah. That dude, he's, yeah, that, that, exactly. So then you grow up, and they do, just like, like Kristen McCaffrey, right? He, he credits Shannon Sharp for like you know a lot of stuff that he's gone through, which I'm a little, I was a little upset. I'm like, <laughs> you credit Shannon? Like, <laughs> you didn't credit your boy TD, man? Yeah, I mean, right. He brought it back, right, right. Yeah. So I, I still talk to him, man. He, you know, he sends me tapes and uh, he asks, he asks, and what, what I love about what he's doing is that he 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 realizes that again, he's got this he's got this growth mentality. Like as good as he is, he still feels like he needs to get better. So he texts me, he sends me cut-ups, and he said, hey, man, can you give me some, some, you know, some tips on what's going on? See, tell me what you see. And I, so, I, so I help him with that and try to give him some of the stuff that I would do if I'm running that play, you know, like tighten your track up a little bit, step on the heels of your tackle or your tight end, make sure that you, you're leaving yourself space between, you know, the fullback, if there's a fullback. And, but a lot of times it's just not, not having tunnel vision being able to see and open up and then allowing your talents and your instincts to take over. And that's it's that's tough to teach somebody how to how to do that. But he, he's got that. But what he wants to know is what's the mentality? What are you seeing when I run this play? And I also tell him too, don't overthink it. You're a great player. I don't want you. You cannot run and think that is right. that is the cardinal sin. You cannot run and think running has to be instinctive. You got to be able to make moves and cuts without thinking about it. Where, where did you get that from, TD, to where you can do those things and, and not think about it? Reps. Uh, reps. 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 Reps and reps. Okay. Guy who's going to be getting a lot of reps here today with the offense. Uh, his offense going against the deep, the defensive backs out there in one-on-one -on -one drills. You see him, Pat Shermer. Phil Milani caught up with Pat to get the inside scoop on the quarterback battle that has been the talk of Broncos training camp. Pat, today's the first day in pads. What changes for the offensive side of the ball? No, we're going to keep executing and trying to execute like we do. Um, you know, the, you really get uh, about as much as you can done in pads without, and also when uh, you're not in pads. So uh, there'll be a little extra banging, obviously. Um, but I think what's important is when we throw the ball, we need to be efficient. We've got to throw and catch and protect. Uh, and when we run the ball, we want to make sure we're running the right pass and getting on guys and, and doing what we can to create some space. I want to ask you about both of the quarterbacks. Yesterday, uh, it seemed like Teddy Bridgewater had a pretty good day. What have you liked about the start of his camp? Well, I think uh, Teddy's done a good job. Certainly, I have familiarity with Teddy from our days in Minnesota. Um, you know, he's an experienced guy. He's been in really a bunch of systems. So um, he's familiar with concepts and how to get the ball out and do those types of things. Um, you know, I really feel like they've, they've both had good days. I think um, fundamentally, everybody tries to evaluate the touchdowns and the interceptions. But there's reasons why those things happen. Um, sometimes there's some drill work that we're working on where we're trying to get the ball down the field, um, you know, where something something bad will happen. And then there's other times when, um, you know, we're moving the ball where you're just taking check down. So um, I think you got to be careful to evaluate um, a quarterback's performance each day based on a couple of plays because I really do think he and Drew are both making great progress. Yeah, we know that uh, it, there's not been any separation. Heard that from uh, head coach Vic Fangio. Drew Locke, uh, it's his second year in your system. Have you seen that growth and development from year two to year one? Yeah, I mean, this year's version of Drew is way ahead of where he was a year ago. Um, you know, we're correcting mistakes that you should correct in, a, in the second year of a system. You know, they're minor details or uh, quick decision-making type things that you learn from in practice. And um, so I'm really pleased with his progress. 
And, you know, again, as we talked about earlier, I think he's gotten better each time he comes out here. And the last one for you here, Pat, is uh, when do you hope to have a decision on who's going to be the guy week one? Yeah, I mean, that's a fair question. I, You know, it's always better sooner than later. But I think as we play this thing out, you know, you've got a veteran quarterback that's benefiting from getting the reps with a new offense. And then you've got a young quarterback that's benefiting from just going out there and playing. And... Um, you know, unfortunately, there's times in a season when you need more than two or more than one quarterback, uh, and they need to come in and execute at a high level. And so um, that's probably the unintended consequence uh, of this competition. Okay, Pat, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. All right, cool. Back to you guys. Thank you very much, Phil. Guys, this quarterback competition, as we just heard from Pat Shermer, it's still even. They're not close to naming a starter yet. TD, in your mind, as an offensive guy, does it matter when they name a starter, or is it just going to be, yeah. hey, you got to be ready? You, you just got to be ready. That too much. Well, yeah, seven I, was I, back. I dealt there, with so. it one year with Bubby and uh, and Greasy. That was the only year I dealt with it, um, because Bubby was coming in as as the starter, uh, but we knew they wanted Brian to, to kind of beat him out. I think what it does, I, I like to know who, my, who you know who the starter is. I don't like to go into camp with this open quarterback competition thing. That's just me personally. Because I, w I want to be able to get behind that one quarterback and then just be able to just focus on that's my guy um, versus rotating in and out with different quarterbacks. And then you have the team who are split. Some guys want, you know, the younger quarterback. Some guys want the other quarterback for whatever reason. Just name the starter. And if the guy happens to lose and get beat out, then that's it is what it is. But I just, yeah, that's just me personally. So, I'm, I'm not knocking the way, you know, Vic is doing this, but I just, you asked me my opinion sure. personally for me as a back in, the, in there, I want as much time with my starter as I can get. So with the quarterback competition, I, I'm with you. I think most of the guys have an idea who they want to be the starter. Even this early in the stage, they have an yeah. idea like, man, I, I think so-and-so should, should have that. They won't say it to the we, media. The, you see it out there. You, players are watching. Right, exactly. They know they're players like, ooh, know. did you see that throw? <laughs> did you see Teddy? Ooh, did you see Lock? Oh, wow. So we're, they're talking and we're watching it. And they watch it a lot more closely. They know a lot more closely. They, they'll go back, watch film, yep. and they'll see the guys who are making mistakes or doing the small things. Whereas we, we're up here. We don't know the, the small mistakes that they're making. We don't know right. the progression that they should be going through. We don't know any of that stuff. But they know. The players know. Yep. They know it. And they, they'll see the mistakes in in uh, in film study. And I think the the big thing. Ooh, nice throw there. Mm -hmm. Nice throw. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Ooh, I see that. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, when you see in the film study. And then I th the, the thing as a, I think for any quarterback, when you watch is they can't continue to make the same mistakes. And to me, if the quarterback is making that same mistake, whether it's throwing late on the out route, Look at that, right? They're not on the same page. Yep. Um, you know, if, if it's a bootleg and the quarterback is, is pulling up at the hash mark when he's told to get outside the hash to, to before he throws, there's just things that, that happen, and they're doing the same things over and over. Yep. I'm like, well, man, we can't trust you. Right. We, we can't trust that you're going to make the right decision when the game is on the line. But um, I, I think, uh, you know, just being on the other side of it. and There he is. You know, knowing Having how him back, boy, having that. Oh, 14. Yes, back. sir. But being on the other side of it, being on the side of the ropes and, you know, being on the commentator side and broadcasting news, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. We don't know what all goes into that, right? We don't, we're not behind the scenes like that. Uh, but we make speculations based off of how many interceptions were thrown or, yeah. uh, you know, if a bad a guy got a bad ball. Whereas it's much more to it than that. It's much more to it because you don't never know if the receiver ran the wrong route or a, a lineman let a guy through. You just never know all the things that go into it. No, you don't. But I know what my eyes tell me. My eyes don't lie. <laughs> and when I see a quarterback making plays, yeah, it's up to it, it is what oh, it yeah. is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that is what it is. He's going to make some mistakes. The big thing for quarterback for me, like the, the biggest trait you can have is resiliency. How fast are you able to bounce back from a bad play? We're all going to have a bad play. Um, but if you have a bad play and all of a sudden that play bothers you for the next five plays and now you're compounding the issue, yes. now we, we got a problem. I need, you, I need you to be able to make that mistake, come back to the huddle, shake it off, and say, let's go, guys. Let's go. And that's, and that's, that's what we want in our, in our lead and our quarterback. 
he may not be the most talented, but, but when, when the game is on the line, I need you to be able to just bounce back and let's go. And then keep the confidence level up. We, we all get challenged there, but this is going to be interesting to me. I, I, I'm curious because what I've said before was this. When people ask me, who you think has the advantage in camp? If this is truly an uh, open quarterback competition, because Teddy is a coach's dream, right? And what I mean by that is he is really judicious with the football. He's not going to put the ball in, uh, in, in harm's way. He's going to run the offense. He's going to look He's going to look really good. And if, and if it comes down to, to that, what he gives a coach is consistency. He gives them something that you can lean Comfort, on. Yeah. I, can, I can work around something that's consistent, even if it's, it doesn't have to be the greatest. But what I can't work around is this stock market stuff. That, yeah. that drives a coach crazy, drives players crazy, drives anybody crazy. You, can't, you just can't have that. So I can build around, all right, I, I know where you are. You're going to stay right here. You're not going to deviate too much. Your lows are not going to be super low. Your highs are not going to be super high. Let's build around that. Let's get you a nice running game. Let's get you some weapons out there. Let's get you a good defense to build around that. So I, I think that, you know, Teddy's looking good. Yeah. As we start the first team period of practice, we see number 55 back out there. He's going to be a little bit limited, but he looks pretty good. Alexis, let's head down for, uh, for some more details about Bradley Chubb's return to the field. Thanks so much, Matt. You know, when it comes to high expectations, Denver's defense has a lot to live up to here in 2021, not only because they have arguably the best secondary in all of football, but also because the front seven features two of the most dynamic pass rushers in the game as well, and Von Miller and Bradley Chubb. Now, especially when these two guys are on the field together, they could do some really dynamic stuff. We all remember that 2018 season. It has burned into the collective brain of Broncos country as Von and Bradley racked up a combined 26 and a half sacks. Now, season ending injuries have plagued the tandem over the last two years, but there does look to be a light at the end of the tunnel as Chubb was cleared to participate in team drills for the first time on Monday, marking the first time that he and Miller had been on the same practice field in nearly 11 months. Now, thanks to that offseason clean out procedure, structurally, his ankle is sound. Chubb said after practice that he felt really, really comfortable, like a brand new person running around out there. While the 2020 Pro Bowler said that it will be up to the training staff on whether or not he plays in any of the Broncos three preseason games he said he's 100% sure he'll be ready to go for the season opener in September coach Fangio said it's really about getting Chubb in shape and having a logical progression for him adding he's confident that he's going to be fine by the time the regular season rolls around and hopes he'll be able to handle a normal workload against the Giants now Chubb and Miller are itching to wreak havoc on the, on the offense like they did in 2018. And I think I could really speak on behalf of Broncos country guys when I say, man, we are looking forward to it just as much as they are. Back up to you. Yes, we are, Alexis. Guys, uh, talking about Bradley Chubb and Vaughn Miller, how much, how much preseason action do these guys need? Obviously, Bradley's coming off the ankle repair this past offseason. Vaughn Miller didn't play at all last season. Guys, to you, TD, first, how much... If it's you personally, how many games you need for preseason one? Um, if that? No, I needed more than that. Okay. Um, see, there we go. I, see? I, I, wait, see, it's in the <laughs> I said, I said for me, man, for me, I, I was the guy that had to practice. I had to, I just, you talked about how do I get like the reps? Now, how do you, how do I get like efficient with like seeing vision and, and instinctively doing things? Repetition. And that, and so to me, practice. The, bet, the, the more I can practice at game speed, which we did, the better I was able to play. And we have some backs who could just not play anything. Danny and Thomas didn't play a single preseason game. You know, Adrian Peterson, they didn't play in the preseason. Week one, they were out the game. I couldn't do that. I, I need, don't know. I, I think you could have, man. No, because Steve, I, I know me. Okay, I got I, you. I, I, you do. I just, I, <laughs> it takes me a while. So I had to practice, and, and I'm the other guy that, in practice, again, some backs, they can get the ball, run five yards, stop, come back, and that was all they did. And they were game, they, they were a different beast. I had to feel like everything I was doing was game, 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 game. Game, game, game. And so I needed those preseason games. I loved when we had that third preseason game and we played majority of the game, you know, three, three quarters, sometimes almost into the fourth quarter. Um, 
So when the fourth preseason game uh, game came and we didn't play, I was fine because I, I, I got it there, but I would get it in practice as well. If, if Coach said we had to play four preseason games, let's go. But hold on. Let's go. So be honest. Once the regular season started, though, it probably took two or three games to get in, in shape Even, for the regular season. Yes, it did. Yeah, it was same same here. You know. Yes, it did. And, and I would imagine if I didn't play in the preseason, it would have took me Even long. eight games yeah, absolutely. to get there. So now with like Bradley Chubb and, and Vaughn, like I just think for them it's really conditioning, right? It's just conditioning. I think that's the biggest thing that you want to get back into that game speed, um, the game conditioning, which is short burst, and you go all out, and then you get, you're recovering fast. You're back out the door, the same thing. You typically get hurt when you get tired. And, you know, when I was later in my, my career and I ha started having you know, knee issues, I was getting hurt because I was getting fatigued more and my legs were getting tired. And then when I get caught in the pile, I couldn't drive out of a tackle, and then my legs get trapped and all of a sudden I get hurt again. So I was getting hurt a lot. And I felt like I just wasn't conditioned like I was before. And I, I saw it on the tape the other day. I broke, had a long run, and I looked horrible. Like I broke and I just, like there was a, a elephant on my back. I ran like, I mean, I just, it's so I, was, I wasn't in shape. For them, it's really just getting back into shape. And I don't know if that's playing them in a the game. Do they want to chance that? Or do you just give extra time after practice? No. Just make sure you just get them really, really in shape so that week one, they're ready to roll. Man, I don't know. I, I, I would say. Would you, would you play them in the preseason? Just to be honest, probably not. No. Um, because both of those guys have played at a high level. We know what they can do. On the one hand, I want to because I want them to get their wind up, to you know, to, to be able to, you know, play several plays. But then at the same time, I don't want to risk it for something that you know doesn't really, you know, doesn't really count. You yeah. know, for games that don't count. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's like that across the board. I think a lot of positions have that. But with those guys in particular, because of the injuries and you know, hey, the amount of money we're paying, I mean, we can't get them hurt. Man. Can't get hurt in the preseason. <laughs> can't think like that. Yeah, yeah. I can't say the money we're paying. I'm not paying them a quarter. <laughs> but by the way, the Broncos is paying them. <laughs> oh, Mike, I see you. Yeah. Yeah, Mike Munchak, the work he does with the offensive line, getting those guys right. And with Jawan James not being here, getting injured, and then that whole situation with him, uh, you know, getting released. How good of a job does he have to do to get this offensive line back up to speed, especially considering you got some new guys in here who weren't even here last year? Well, I think the Bulls making that step, I think it speaks volume, right? I mean, it, it was people ready to give up on him, saying that, you know, maybe he just was not going to be the tackle that they, they drafted. And, you know, he was had a ton of holding penalties. And last year, huge season, man, breaks out and, really became that the tackle that they envisioned. So you got to create or credit Mike for that. Um, and I think that's where the, the consistency has to come is, is up front. You know, the last couple of years you've had a, that, that reshuffled offensive line. Juwan James coming in, not really playing, um, you know, then opting out and now not here. So you, you, get, you got a lot going on up front. Um, you just got to make sure that that line, and typically the line that stays together performs. You know, if you can keep that same five lineup in and you have continuity, it's the most important thing for an offensive line. It's the continuity. Those guys up front, you can't have guys shuffled in and out, get switching injured. getting injured, switching yeah. positions. It's, it is a tough thing, and, and it, it doesn't – people it, people gloss over that a lot. They don't really focus on – how important it is to have that. I was fortunate. The line I had, for the most part, we were consistent. We, did, we didn't shuffle a whole lot. We were consistent in our lineups week to week. And um, because the backs have to get used to that, quarterbacks have to get used to that. Um, and then they have to get used to each other, communicating, being able to have nonverbals. You know, a lot of times you have calls where you don't have time. I don't have time to give you the call. Yeah. Ball is snap. You, you, we got to be thinking the same thing. Oh, and small, small things like, all right, were you aligned? And in the first step, I saw, I've seen games where guys accidentally step, step on, on each other's foot. Yeah, because they haven't played. <laughs> so, they haven't played together enough. Oh, my bad. I've been no, not, no, not, you, not you. I said, <laughs> I'm sitting in the game. Like, hey, make it off my foot. Right. Like, it's, it, there's a lot that goes on. And, and trying to get that that puzzle together to fit and uh, and then perform on game day is it's challenging. Yeah. But if anybody can do it, it's Mike. How much does a good position coach, you guys have had some of the best, Ed Donatel, Steve was your position coach, Bobby Turner, yeah. when you were here in Denver, how much does a 
great position coach help those young guys? Or what can that do for their transformation? We saw it last year with Bulls. Uh, coaching matters. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> coaching matters. And I would challenge anybody who says that coaching doesn't matter. Um, it does. Bobby Turner, I'll give you some examples how Bobby challenged me when I was playing. We would have just like practice, and we'd have tackle period, whatever, scrimmage. And whether it was a preseason game, whatever, and we'd watch the breakups. And Bobby, I would make it play. I'd, I'd run through one tackle, and then two people would tackle me. I'd go through the thing and get tackled. And he would run that play, and he'll say, you're going down too easy. I need more out of that play. And so after a while, he kept saying that. And when he would first said, I would, I would, you know, get a little upset. Like, man, you're crazy, dude. Like, you get mad at him for saying it. But he kept doing it over and over. And what he was doing, he was challenging me to think differently, to think like nobody should tackle you. I don't care if there's three people right there. You have your mentality has to be you, they can't bring you down. Mm -hmm. And so when I when I finally started to understand that, and he got me upset, so I had to prove him. I was like, all right, I'm gonna prove you wrong with that. So I started thinking that nobody could bring me down, but that led to me trying to run through more tackles. I would, I, I mean, I tried hard as I could. That one person can't tackle me. That's a no-no. I still can't. Still, yeah, <laughs> still can't tackle. <laughs> but 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 he but he, but he was really good at that, and he was a teacher. He wasn't. He coach you up with technique and stuff, but then he taught you. You know, he allowed you to be able to to teach you things that um, you know that you that you didn't know or. Uh, bring in, bring in some tape. Let let you watch guys that he coached before, and and then he just knew, he just he just knew when to just sometimes not say anything, you know. Let you go out there and not get in your head. So have you had bad running back coaches throughout your life? Oh my God! And, 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 and I think we all we, we, we don't need to name them, but no, I don't want to name them. But oh, like, I, oh, I, I, how, uh, how, wait, wait, how did wait, they wait, 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 no, wait. No, Is this a national TV I, I show? Like, no, no, we're not naming them. We're not naming them. <laughs> but how did they differ? They didn't do all those things. It was more. It was. It, it was more of. It was more of do it my way. My way is the right way, and if you don't do it my way, then you're doing it wrong. Right. Right. It was. It was. I'm teaching from the book. Right. And you need to do it this way. Yeah. Versus, okay. Hey, Steve. Hey, TD. I'm gonna recommend you do it this way. But hey, whatever you feel, as long as the results are the same. Right. Then I want you to, to kind of do it the best, do it the way you, you want to do it, right. but make sure that the results are the oh, same. Oh, man. Yes. You know what I mean? Don't, the coaches don't, out there, listen to this. And, and then for <laughs> running backs, man, you can't tell running backs how to run. Either they got it or they don't. I, some, it, guys, some guys got it and some guys don't. You can't tell me where to cut. You got to tell me, hey, dude, just go out there. Here's your cues. And then you react at, you know, off of that and, and make some plays. Whether it's the running backs, we see him there with Melvin Gordon and then Bryce Freeman, or the quarterback battle, our local Ooh, beat yeah. writers here have had their eyes peeled on everything. Alexis Perry is with one of our favorites, a Broncos beat alumnus, Nick Cosmeter. Hey, Alexis. Yes, thanks so much, Matt. I am here with Nick Cosmeter from The Athletic. Nick, things have been so great. Five and a half days into practice. What are your overall impressions from what you've seen from this team so far? Well, number one, it's just great to be out here. Now, obviously, last year we were watching it from the berm. Nobody was out here. Um, and, you know, I think one of the, the first things that stuck out to me is just this team has offensive talent. Um, so if, if they can get this quarterback position right, if they can get, you know, effective ball control play from that unit um, and get into the hands of these guys, that, that's what stuck out to me so far. Yeah, speaking of the quarterback battle, like I mentioned, five and a half days in, how would you grade the competition between Teddy Bridgewater and Drew Locke so far? Yeah, I think it's been pretty close. You know, Vic Fangio said, listen, there's been no separation. Certainly on a different days, that hasn't been the case. Like yesterday, for example, Teddy Bridgewater really bounced back well from that Saturday practice. I think there was one period where he completed 13 passes in a row, 12 passes in a row, um, which we know he can do. He can hit consistently. The thing that's impressed me about him the last two days, pushing the ball down the field a little bit more. Um, but, you know, but I think it's I think it's still close. Um, I, I think, well, you're really going to start to see some of that separation is when we go to Minnesota next week, two practices against a different defense and then the preseason game. That's where you got to come away from and say, okay, somebody's got to be in the lead here. Well, the underwear Olympics are over. The guys are in pads here today. So what position group are you really watching out here in pads? How can you get a better evaluation of them? Well, even just to start, you got the one-on-one -on -one drills with the outside linebackers going against the tight ends. So that's fun to see. Just, you know, that's the first time since the end of last year you get to kind of see guys in, in game.
engaging in those sort of drills. So those are the kind of things you're watching. How can what kind of pressure can that that edge create? That defensive line create because that's a group this team is really trying to hang its hat on. Um, you know, Von Miller's back. Bradley Chubb working through the ankle injury should be ready. Malik Reed had a big year last year. How can those guys combine with that defensive front of Shelby Harris, Draymond Jones, and Mike Purcell when he gets back out here? Um, that that to me is the group that I'm watching. How much pressure can that group create? In terms of the running backs, we've talked about Javante Williams a little bit on this show. How do you see Williams pushing Melvin Gordon here for RB1? Well, today was great because yesterday we asked him, as soon as the word pads came out of a reporter's mouth after asking him that question about today's practice, his eyes kind of lit up. And, and he's that guy that I think you will see him when the pads come on be that player he was at North Carolina that, that will put a hurt on you if you're not ready to tackle him. Um, you know, I still think Melvin Gordon has looked great in this camp, and he has the veteran experience. He's a guy who got a lot better as the year went on a year ago. Um, so I, I think I, I, Melvin Gordon, to me, is still going to be that running back running back one. Um, but Javante Williams, you're going to have to have two guys that you're almost splitting throughout this season, especially with 17 games. So I think it's going to be more of a tandem than any one guy probably taking that lead. With rookies being the theme of our show here today, Day. Is there any other rookie that's really standing out to you? Well, certainly, I mean, everybody who's been out here can see the talent in Patrick Sertan, but not just the talent. What struck to me is every teammate we've talked to uses this word calm. It's not something you typically associate with, you know, a football player, much less a rookie. Um, but you can see it out on the field. There's there's no wasted motion in what he does. He's prepared. Um, he's been moved around the field in different ways, and so he just seems ahead of the game, which is encouraging. Um, you know, kind of an end-of-the-draft guy to watch to me is Jonathan Cooper. There's a great battle for that fourth or fifth outside linebacker position behind uh, Miller, Chubb, and Reed. And, and Jonathan Cooper uh, missed a lot of the OTAs after having a, a heart procedure, but he's looked great out here. I, I think he's going to have a real shot to make this team. Okay, before I let you go, i love to know more about bubble guys. So it's a small sample size so far. Is there another guy that you want to stake your claim on, put the Nick Cosmiter name on? Well, I, I think certainly the, the wide receiver spot is interesting. You know, Tyree Cleveland made the team as a seventh-round pick last year. They kept seven guys. He's been a little bit hurt. Um, Seth Williams is a sixth rounder who, who's trying to battle to make this team. But look at a couple of these other guys. Trinity Benson has had a great camp uh, so far, caught a couple touchdowns on the first day. Um, and then Kendall Hinton, who we all know is the, our emergency quarterback hero from week 12. He had a great OTAs. Vic Fangio said, hey, he's in the mix to maybe get one of those last receiver spots. He's been really good in my mind so far in this camp. So that, that's kind of what I'm watching. Who's going to get that last wide receiver spot? Nick, thank you so much for your time. Where can we follow you on Twitter? Uh, at Nick Cosmiter. And um, follow us at The Athletic at theathletic.com slash Broncos. Yeah, make sure you guys subscribe to The Athletic for more great content from Nick and all the other great writers there. Guys, back up to you. All right, thank you very much, Alexis. As we wrap up our coverage here at UC Health Training Center, there's a couple of guys that we know, Steve Antonopoulos and number seven. It is Hall of Fame week after all, guys. TD, what's it like seeing uh, those two guys on the screen? Yeah, he's, got his, he's got his golf uniform on right now, <laughs> so I know, I know he's either, he's, either uh, he's got a tee time set up and, and Greek, man. Steve Antonopoulos, that guy is the best in the business. Man, I spent many, many, too, too many hours yes. <laughs> in the training room with Greek. And, uh, but he's the best, man. It's, 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 we, we had the best. I, I just feel like from player to staff, uh, players to staff to owner, we just had the best. You know, we went through a, a period of time where I think we had more people on our, on our staff than any other team. And that's because Mike Shanahan... And, and Pat Boland were, were two who believed that whatever we need to do to make you guys successful, we're going to do. Yes. And once we started to do that, and yeah, all he asked is just go, go, hey, just go play. Just go play. Football. Just play. If you, if you go out there and you and you uh, you, you you play hard, um, you can ask for anything, man. And so we were able to do that. But we had a lot of fun too, then. We had a ball. Oh, <laughs> I miss it, man. Yeah. What, Winning is winning is very winning is fun. Right, TD, right. this is uh, this is of course Hall of Fame week. John will be there. Yeah. Uh, you will be in Canton. Our guy is going in. Any advice? No, man, Steve, the Hall of Famer. This is Steve's hey, last show advice, before he goes man. to Canton. Any advice? Advice. We, we advice from we talked. from the veteran. We, we already talked, but I told him I said pace yourself this week. It is a long week. There's a lot of events going on. Um, your family's going to be in town. Fran's going to be in town. He's not going to have a lot of time to see it, see people. Yeah. But I did tell him that speech. It boy, that's a hard one. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's on, a hard. Just, just tell me it can be easy, man. 
Hey. No, they, they called me yesterday. They said they had, I had to shorten it down even more because oh, they made me some That's even better. Yeah, yeah. It's that's, all e- good. that's even better. I should have t- I should have taken that advice. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's. I told her that that was the most nervous I've been because it's just it's weird. You know, you come back and you know you have to try to you give a speech and you realize you have to try to condense and put everybody in your life inside this eight minutes. And then you feel bad because you're, you're leaving somebody out, and it's like, all right, I didn't say that right. And then you prepare for it, and it's like, ah, I should just – it was just – I overthought it. Yeah. But I just told him, enjoy the week. Pace yourself because it's going to be a long week. If you can, try try to see the people that, that that's coming up there to see you because I didn't, I didn't get a chance to see anybody. I'm just going to see him. I told him at the party on Friday night, yeah. that would be the time where we get a chance to kind of hang out some. But aside yeah. from that, then, you know, I'll, I'll probably – be on the run. Enjoy it, man. It's congratulations, no, bro. Man, I appreciate you, man. Appreciate you all the advice and uh, support over the years, man. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this is long overdue. This is ridiculous. It's, it, it, it's it, it, you know, it's taking this long anyway for you to to get in. And uh, I've always said, man, Steve should have always been in there, bro. And uh, appreciate appreciate you being a big brother to me. Give, giving me, Steve, on, we got the same so, birthday. So Steve would always give me some advice too. And this a lot of people don't understand. Like as a running back. He would, from the defensive side of the ball, he would always tell me, like, after the play or after our, our period was over, he'd come over and say, hey, man, hey, listen, man, like, you know, keep your head up. You know, because when you come down your head, you're, you're getting super low and you can get hurt. Or, you know, on this play, uh, you, you, when you stepped up, when you started looking to your left, I knew you were going over there. Like, he would just give me tips like that. And so I, I certainly appreciated that. And then life tips. My oh, real estate, he gave me real estate lessons and stuff, man. <laughs> Off the house. Come on, Steve. Hey, it's right. Oh, man. We, we, we do have each other, man. I appreciate you, man. Really we do good. appreciate you, TD, taking some time with us. We, I see you at the Defy yes. Water on there. Yes. Let us know what you yes. got going on All in Denver. Right, so, so here's the deal. In my Defy Water, uh, we just launched launched in, in uh, King Supers. So we have a three-day launch event at uh, the locations. Go to our social handle to get the locations. But we have giveaways, some King Supers cards. We're giving away signed jerseys, cards, uh, selfies with me. Uh, all kinds of really good stuff. But the great thing about this water, this is our hero water. Uh, every um, every bottle sold, a portion of the proceeds goes back to um, charities. We have three charities that we're supporting. The Centers for African American Health, which is based right here in Denver. We have the Disabled uh, of American Veterans. And then we have the National Association of, Bus- of Women Business Owners. So those are three that we initially are starting with. But we're going to expand that out to support more organizations as we go. It's wow. the best water in the world, man. Good water for best a good water cause. In the world. Go out there, get, King Supers. Get go, go get your water, man. I, go I get, get your water. I got to get I gotta yes, give you some water after, and, the, uh, and, after and, practice and there. And find out your planning. So, you know, <laughs> I, I do it all. I'm a man of many traits right now. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Broncos Appreciate country, you. this will be Steve's last show. He heads to Canton tomorrow. Tomorrow we are back, though, with our live programming. 9.30 a.m. will be on with the Broncos country tonight. Guys, Ryan Edwards and Benjamin Albright will be in the house helping fill the shoes of the Hall of Famer. But for now, that is going to do it for us. For Alexis Perry and the Hall of Famer Steve Atwater, I'm yeah. Matt Boyer. We will see you tomorrow, Broncos country, at 9.30 a.m. for Broncos Training Camp Live, presented by U.S. Bank. TV.